If there's any part of the Bible which is absolutely rejected, ridiculed, and disbelieved, it's what the Bible has to say about the age of the earth. So, astounding evidence for a young earth. Well, before I even start just jumping into the evidence and the science and how it all works, every once in a while I read something and it's, it like just hits me. Wow, is that really how our culture thinks? Is that really what's going on? And one of those hit me about a year ago. I was, I was reading a commentary from Chuck Colson, uh, the head of his prison ministries named Mark Early, and his daughter had left for college. And she's a strong Christian and felt, yeah, I've got to engage in the culture. I've got to engage in conversations. So she started talking to the, to the new students, the new freshmen she'd met about the Bible and about Jesus. And, you know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a pretty audacious statement. Um, so here's uh, Mark Early's daughter, and she's sitting around with her discussion group, and she says, I was excited that my friends at college were open as I shared that Jesus Christ, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And they actually listened to me. You know, she was excited. But then she said they were just as enthused when Amy stated, well, I believe we're all God. And everybody seemed quite receptive when Tammy stated, well, she didn't even believe God existed. That's just her viewpoint. But there was total agreement and lots of nodding of the head when Sarah stated, well, you realize God is really only relevant if you have a strong conviction. You need to have a strong conviction. If you do, he's relevant. If you're not, God isn't really relevant. But what really amazed her was that as they got done discussing all these very different concepts, they said, well, you know what? We're all really saying the same thing. Now, let's change that conversation for a moment and just change one little thing about it. Here's Mark Early's daughter. He's at college. She says, I was excited that my new friends at college were open as I shared that gravity operated everywhere in the universe. But they were just as enthused when Amy stated, why, I believe we control gravity. And everybody seemed quite receptive when Tammy stated she didn't even believe gravity existed. And there was total agreement when Sarah said, you know, gravity is only relevant if you have a strong conviction. But what really astonished me was that my friend stated, you know, we're really all saying the same thing. Now, you see what's going on in our cultures? We have totally separated physical things, scientific things, and we give them one set of ways we treat them, and spiritual concepts, which are just as absolute, either true or false, as the scientific things, as the laws of gravity. Either they're true or they're false. Yet we treat them completely different. Alan Bloom wrote a landmark book in 1987, very revealing as to the attitudes of students coming in. He made this statement. There's one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering university believes or says they believe that truth is relative. Now, you can kind of read through that and say, well, that's nice. They're tolerant. They're tolerant of all beliefs. That's so nice they're not dogmatic. But think about the implications. You know, as polls have been taken of our youth, and I've got the actual sheet up here somewhere, or I'm going to have to go by memory, the difference between those who say they believe the Bible is God's revealed word, youth groups, students who have grown up in churches like John, when they're polled about how often do they lie to their parents, how often do they cheat on tests, how often do they take things from school or other students, is identical to non-Christian students. There's no difference between the attitudes and actions of Christians and non-Christians. A poll was taken of 20,000 students in, in Christian schools. This isn't even public schools, Christian school, schools. And they were asked, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? 63% of them said no. They were asked, do you believe the Holy Spirit's a real entity? 58% of them said no. These are Christians. You see, if truth is relative, then we do make up our own rules. And that's a dangerous situation. And the only way to control sin at that point is increasing government regulations, laws, and imprisonments because we've lost a moral standard. Now, how did we get there? How do we get from a Western civilization in Europe, America, Canada, where we had an absolute standard, which was the Bible, 
undeniably 150, 200 years ago, that was the absolute standard, to today, where there really is no standard. Well, I believe there was a defining point in history, several of them, but the first absolute critical defining point happened in a little innocuous town in a back country state in Tennessee, Dalton, Tennessee, and it was called the Scopes Monkey Trial. You see, what was happening here was the Christian community was getting increasingly worried about evolution being taught in schools. We've got to stop this. We can't allow it. Well, that's not education. That's indoctrination. What we have to do is look at what are the facts, because they do line up with God's word, and Christians don't have to be afraid of the truth or reality or science or anything else. So they passed these laws that said you can't teach evolution. Well, the ACLU, which is, has always from its start been a undermine the Bible in any way possible organization, they ran an ad to advertise for a teacher who would oppose it, a substitute teacher who later said he never taught evolution, named John Scopes, agreed to be in the trial and say he had taught it. Um, no one ever went to jail. No one ever paid much, any money. There was, it was a really a cordial affair. Um, but the two top, most public, well-known lawyers in the nation faced off on this issue. Is creation true or is evolution true? Williams Jennings Bryan was a three-time nominee for the presidency of the United States from the Democratic Party. Clarence Darrow was basically was an atheist. He, he worked for the crime bosses of Chicago, very, very articulate and talented lawyer came in to defend evolution and essentially atheism. So really this was a trial between Christianity and atheism centering on can you trust the Bible, is creation true? Well, the trial went on and they brought in this expert and that expert and it lasted over a week and not much was accomplished. And finally Clarence Darrow said, tell you what, you take the witness stand and defend the Bible as truth and the next day I'll take the witness stand and defend evolution as truth. And Williams Jennings Bryan, he said, that's fine, we'll do that. And Clarence Darrow just ripped him up one side and down the other. Now, William Jennings Bryan was very well read, very well written, a very strong Christian, very well respected in the Christian community. And you have to understand the impact. You've got to understand America of the day, 1925, no TV, no video games, very few people going to movies. The entertainment was the radio. And this was broadcast all day long on the radio. The transatlantic cable was laid, Europe was listening, America was listening, Canada was listening. Day in and day out, atheism versus Christianity, great entertainment. He asked questions like, well, you know, Adam and Eve, they had Cain, Seth, and Abel, and Cain killed Abel, and you're left with two boys. Tell me now, how do those two boys reproduce to produce all the people on this earth? And Williams Jennings Bryan says, I don't know. He was made to look like an absolute fool in defending the biblical viewpoint in front of the nation. We'll talk about that later if you're really interested and you don't know the answer. It's very scientifically revealing what ha happened. Well, then he gets near the end of his questions, and this is like the laser point of the trial, the laser point of history, where Clarence Darrow says, and remember, he's arguing to the nation. He's not arguing to Williams Jennings Bryan. He's making a publicity case to the nation. He says, do you think the earth was made in six days? To which he answered, the man representing Christianity, well, not six days of 24 hours. Well, I'm confused. Doesn't the Bible say that? Now, agnostics and atheists and skeptics and searchers, if they're at all interested, they know what the Bible says. It's absolutely clear. It's exactly what it says. To which the man representing Christianity answers, no, sir, denying what it actually says. Well, now I'm really confused. Does the statement the morning and the evening were the first day and the morning and the evening were the second day mean anything to you? Well, I do not see any necessity of construing the words the morning and the evening as meaning necessarily a 24-hour day. Boy, I don't, what else could they mean? So, 
says the man representing atheism, the creation might have been going on for a very long time. Christian response, it might have continued for millions of years. That is the definition of evolution. Creation has been going on and continuing for millions of years as slow modifications have happened. You see, before the world, the man representing biblical truth folded his tent on this issue and went home. The next day, Clarence Darrow came in, said, Your Honor, we plead guilty. My client did teach evolution. That's what the trial's about. No further questions are needed. And he never had to defend evolution. They had won the publicity battle. And I believe the church was so embarrassed from that time on in America, they just backed off. They didn't want to touch scientific issues. They didn't want to deal with it. They just started compromising what God's Word had to say with this whole age issue, with predictable results. If you can't trust what it says at the beginning, why would you trust things it said later on? Why not separate spiritual reality from physical reality? You know, this is what it says. I went over this last night. It's just so clear. It's just absolutely crystal clear. Mark Twain said, it's not those things that I don't understand that bother me. It's the things that I do understand that bother me. There was a creation of separate kinds of plants and animals. There really was man spitting in God's face and saying, I want to make the rules. Becoming an antagonist to God, as we all have been ever since. There really was a worldwide catastrophe. Um, and at some point, I hope we'll come back and I'll do a whole hour talking about the flood and all of the things and all the evidence that supports that as a reality of history and so on. That's the biblical model. But the most ridiculed thing is this age of the earth because, well, let, okay, let's go on. Many people here, I don't think, really understand, well, you know, there's nowhere I can look up 6,000 years and the Bible comes up with that. Where, where does that come from? Well, what does the Bible say about the age of the earth? The first thing, that's I think is just this huge clue, God said he made a certain things on day one. Every time the word yom, day, is numbered, every single 100% of the time, it means a literal earth day. It's what it was meant to mean. And at the end of day one, day three, day three, day four, day five, day six, God was done. He looked at all of creation and he said it was very good. Everything he saw was very good. Well, a lot of Christians are trying to shoehorn millions and billions of years into the Bible where they say, well, that's just because that's when God made Adam and Eve, but there's been all these millions of years of death and struggle and slow building up of the geological layers. Well, in essence, that's saying God's looking at a fossil graveyard of death, extinctions, and disease, and his, in his definition, the holy God of the universe, that's his definition of very good. Now, see, that's a huge problem. That doesn't fit the story that undermines people's belief in Scripture. But the biggest problem isn't even in Genesis. It's where God, in his, with his own hand, wrote the moral code by which people should live. And it's also the moral code by which we know we are sinners because we can't live that way without his help. And in one of the Ten Commandments, God said, in six days, it's the only commandment where God tells us why he said it. All the other ones he says, don't murder each other, don't steal from each other, don't lie to each other, don't have other gods beside me. But when he gets to this one, he said, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, and he rested on the seventh. Now you go and do likewise, work for six and rest on the seventh. Well, in six million year periods, God made the heavens and the earth. Now you go work for six million years and then you can rest for the next million. See, it doesn't make any sense. It falls apart. And if that doesn't mean what it says, why obey the commandment? And if you don't obey that commandment, why should you have to obey any of the commandments? Relativism. I set the rules. You see, it all falls apart. See how clear it becomes if you just read what it says and, and understand it as it says? And Jesus said, when asked about marriage, well, haven't you read? He which made them at the beginning, made them male and female. At the beginning of what? At the beginning of when we are a single-celled, single-sex organism? No, he's referring to the beginning of creation. So it's pretty clear to me anyway that the Bible really talks about a literal creation in a literal six days. It's just what it says and it's what it means. And then in chapter 5, you get one of those boring areas, which really aren't boring for a number of reasons, but I'm only going to talk about this one. It lists how long Adam had and he had a son, and then how long Seth had and he had a son, and how long Enos had and he had a son. 
Well, you just add all those up, you come all the way down to Abraham, and it adds up to right around 2,000 years. And we know historically Abraham to Jesus was about 2,000 years, and Jesus to the present day is about 2,000 years. You come up, if you read the Bible like any other book, it clearly says the world is about 6,000 years old. Now that's just a phenomenal, unbelievable concept in the world today. Now why is that so unbelievable? Because it was a straightforward, everybody believed it, for the first 1800 years after Christ. And this was the same period of time where Faraday and Newton and um, later um, Maxwell were developing all of the foundations of modern science and none of them had any difficulty with this time frame. It's only been in the last 100 to 150 years that it's become a big issue in science. Well, that's because of the evolution model. It has to have enormous periods of time to make the unbelievable seem believable. You can't disconnect the two. Cosmic evolution to seem believable needs huge periods of time. Chemical evolution to seem believable needs huge periods of time. Biological evolution to seem believable needs huge periods of time. And all of it says there has always been death and disease and destruction and one type of creature wiping out another. Now, just to reinforce what we're up against, I'm going to show a series of video clips that lasts about five minutes uh, to show the conditioning that we are all, including myself, because I came out of school uh, an agnostic, really not believing much of anything, um, and, and this was a big part of why I ended up where I ended up. Um, we're going to let this run. It starts with Carl Sagan. We wish to pursue the truth no matter where it leads. But to find the truth, we need imagination and skepticism both. We will not be afraid to speculate, but we will be careful to distinguish speculation from fact. Evolution is a fact, not a theory. It really happened. The Big Bang is at upper left in the first second of January 1st. 15 billion years later is our present time, the last second of December 31st. I ask you a question, Ethel. Why does a man have to die? The world goes on for millions of years, and how long is a man's life? This much, a drop, a microscopic fragment. A DNA strand like me is a blueprint for building a living thing. And sometimes animals that went extinct millions of years ago, like dinosaurs, left their blueprints behind for us to find. We just had to know where to look. A hundred million years ago, there were mosquitoes, just like today. And just like today, they fed on the blood of animals. Even dinosaurs. This fossilized tree sap, which we call amber, waited for millions of years with the mosquito inside until Jurassic Park scientists came along. Using sophisticated techniques, they extract the preserved blood from the mosquito and, bingo, dino DNA. As a research student working for a doctorate, I realized how significant it would be if the radiation could still be detected some 15 billion years later. In this video, we will take a close look at animals and plants, not as isolated oddities, but as elements in a long and continuous story that began billions of years ago. Is it possible that something is holy to the celebrated agnostic? Yes. 
the individual human mind. Dr. Page of Overland College tells me this rock is at least 10 million years old. Well, well. Spock, as suspected, the probe's transmissions are the songs sung by whales. Whales? Specifically, humpback whales. That's crazy. Who would send a probe hundreds of light years to talk to a whale? It's possible. Whales have been on Earth far earlier than man. Ten million years earlier, and humpbacks were heavily hunted by man. They've been extinct since the 21st Many century. People need to see what I've seen. They need to see... This is the way it's been done for billions of years. A small skull. A juvenile. Face intact. The Tong child had lived one to two million years before. Dart sees humanity in the skull, and fulfillment of Darwin's prediction that the first humans had evolved in Africa. Comets began far out in space. There was left over from the creation of the solar system after the planets were formed billions of years ago. And these million years ago in the Devonian age, this entire area was covered by a tropical sea. Inside this rock is a 387 million year old snail. And this is a fossilized colonial coral head from the same period. Also in this area, you can find the remains of some of the mammals who came after the seas receded. This is the tooth of a woolly mammoth. It's a relative youngster, only about 12,000 years old. Our natural history of the planet, and to try to give a sense of wonder to everybody of what came before us. Now, a remarkable discovery is helping reveal secrets that have been buried for 67 million years. 65 million years ago, a giant asteroid crashed into Earth, wreaking environmental havoc that some scientists believe killed off the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. What is left of them is fossilized in the rocks, and it is in the rock that real scientists make real discoveries. These guys, for example, the trilobites, appeared 600 million years ago. They were around for 300 million years. They're all gone. There's none left. But in those old rocks, there are no fossils of people or cattle. We've evolved only recently. Evolution is a fact, not a theory. It really happened. But we will be careful to distinguish speculation from fact. Carl Sagan, he ran a series in the 60s. He says, I'm clearly going to separate truth from speculation. He goes on to speculate endlessly. Um, he makes statements near the end about you don't find fossils of cattle in with fossils of trilobite. Well, that's because whenever you do uh, find a, a sediment layer that contains fossils, it's a, on top of things that were supposedly more ancient it's assumed they were thrust up over that rock layer. So any, no matter what you find, it will fit evolution. And he can say, therefore, it's a fact. The, the massive indoctrination of, with evolution. I've just estimated that by the time any of our children get through high school, um, they've been told in excess of 2,000 times by movies, by museums, by newspapers, uh, by their classes, by their textbooks, that things are millions and billions of years old. That's why it's so hard to consider any other possibility. But this is a fact. In the vast majority of dating methods are young Earth dating methods. They indicate things are not millions and billions of years old. Uh, they, they, and I'm going to share just a few of those. We're not going to go through all those, and I know you can't even see them, but that's not what is important. Things like how long has it taken the salt to get into the Dead Sea? How long has it taken the salt to build up in the oceans? How much helium is in various places? How fast would it take the pressure in oil wells to leak off? Everybody has their favorites. We're going to touch a few of them. But before we talk about dating methods, it's worthless. Because I can talk about a bunch of young Earth dating methods, and someone else will come along, and they'll talk about radiometric and old age dating methods. But if you don't know how dating methods work, you're not going to know who's right. You know, you've got to understand how they all work to decide for yourselves do they make sense or not. You see, all of these dating methods work by this equation. The amount of time that has passed is equal to the amount of something divided by the rate at which it changes. For instance, if I went out one morning 
to do as John suggested and read through my Bible in that month and sit by that tree at 6 in the morning where I have some free time. And I see John come walking along. And it's 6 in the morning, and I know that John lives 21 miles away from me, and the average person walks at about 3 miles an hour. I can date when he left. You see, 21 miles, the amount divided by 3 miles per hour, the rate, is seven hours. He left seven hours ago. He was seven hours earlier, less old when he left. Now, okay, but it's six in the morning. That means he left at 11 o'clock at night. You see, I did a dating method. I used the equation right, but I didn't necessarily get the right answer because I have to know everything to get the right answer. I have to be omnipotent. You know, I might have had the measured mount wrong. He might have driven and his car just broke down around the corner and he's only been walking for half a mile. Half a mile. He's only been on the road for a few minutes. I'm off by an order of magnitude in my dating method. I might have got the contamination of the route wrong. There might be a shortcut I don't know about and it isn't 21 miles because the road goes way out around. He's only been on a road that's seven miles long and he's only been going for two miles. or. He might have taken up marathon running, and he's actually jogged the entire way and just slowed down right before I saw him. And he's been moving along at, at eight, nine miles an hour because he's a fast runner. So he's only been on the road for a couple hours. See, I get the totally wrong answer if I don't get everything right. Well, I'm going to jump in. Knowing that, I'm going to jump in to probably the most controversial dating method. It's the radiometric dating method. You know, at the, as you look back in the, the geologists of the day, they thought the Earth was hundreds of thousands of years old in the late, early 1800s, and then they thought it was millions of years old in the mid-1800s, and it wasn't until the early 1900s they started to believe it was billions of years old, and they found a dating method that seemed to indicate that. Radiometric dating works like a sand timer. You see, if when the rocks, say granite, formed, there was radioactive elements locked into it, uranium, plutonium, and it takes, say, 10 million years for half of that plutonium to decay into lead. And we find a rock that has half plutonium and half lead. We say, well, 10 million years must have passed. Now, that's a reasonable argument because you can look at a whole bunch of different radioactive elements and you can line them up and you can show that they have all decayed and the current decay rate of those elements is very, very slow. So you come to a logical conclusion that huge periods of time have passed in those rocks. Well, and that's the way things stood for the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. There was no good answer to that. Um, in 1993, the Institute for Creation Research, having no idea what they were going to find, decided to start in-depth studying these radiometric dating methods. Now, you can point out various discrepancies in rocks that have recently come out of volcanoes that are dated millions of years old. And it's not convincing because the evolutionists will say, well, that's just material that's been reworked, and that's why the dating method's wrong. It kind of begs the question, well, then, how do you know the dating method's right on other rocks? But even ignoring all that, um, this is one thing we know. In the major type of radioactive decay, when the uranium decays, it spits out an alpha particle, which is just a helium nucleus, which grabs an electron and turns into a helium molecule. And when uranium decays to lead, it goes through eight distinct radioactive steps and kicks out eight molecules of helium. Well, this radioactive decay happens in the rocks, in the rock formations, in the little crystals that are inside of the rock. And since the decay happens in the rock, after the rock has cooled, the helium is trapped there in the rocks. Well, helium, as we know, is a very highly permeating molecule. We, we've all, as children, had these rubber balloons. I actually got this balloon last night, and it's already lost so much helium that it no longer floats. You see, the helium just zips right through the surface of that latex rubber balloon. If I take a metallized balloon now, that was given to my wife at Valentine's Day. So that balloon is about a week and a half old. It still floats. But we also know that in about a month, it will also lose the helium because helium is so energetic. You know, you think of this podium as being solid, 
But unless you're at absolute zero, all molecules are vibrating. They're just constantly just vibrating slightly and in motion. And helium will actually work its way through solid stainless steel. You can use it as a leak detector through solid metals because it's so energetic it'll work its way out. It's such a small molecule. And with time, it permeates out into the air. But no one had ever bothered to measure how fast does the helium that's formed during all these radioactive processes, how long does it take for it to come back out of the rocks that it's been formed inside of? You see, the older the rock, the less helium that should be present. It's, it's like this. Suppose I was, went over to Israel, and you know I, I'm, I'm downstairs in the lobby, and, and a man comes up and says, Ah, oh, illustrious visitor, my name is Ahab, and I and my brother, we have discovered an ancient tomb that no one else has found. For only $500, I can take you to this tomb, and there have been no other human beings in there. We have not even opened the door to this tomb yet. And, you know, being a trusting fellow, I give him my $500. And we go and we creep down and go out in the desert and we go through the, and the spider webs are everywhere and there's dust and there's no tracks on the floor. And we creep down through there and we open the tomb and we crack open the door. And we step into the tomb nobody's been before except there's a helium balloon floating on the ceiling. <laughs> you see, I would absolutely know I had been lied to. Well, the modern tour guides of today are the evolutionists who will tell us all of this radioactive decay has happened millions and billions of years ago because there is enormous quantities of helium still locked up in the rocks that couldn't possibly be there. You see, one of the results of this eight-year study at ICR was, well, let me just back up a step. Um, inside of all the granite all over this planet, there are little zircon crystals. And inside of the zircon crystals, we see these discolorations as the radioactive, um, millions of atoms of uranium have discolored, sent out alpha particles, which have turned to helium, which have been trapped inside of the zircon. Well, in a six-year study using world-class labs and zircons at various levels and temperatures all over the world, they found out the permeation rate, how fast does the helium that was formed come out of those crystals. And what they found out was that it had to have come out within the last 6,000 years. The radioactive decay had to have happened within the last 6,000 years because how rapidly that helium works its way through those crystals. It shouldn't be there. It absolutely couldn't physically be there. The reason I jump on this is because I've worked for 25 years for Dow Chemical. I've worked in the styrofoam department where we put an insulating gas inside of the foam. You see, permeation of gas through a substance is a known physical constant. You can look it up in the chemical books of physics. The only thing that will change it is temperature, and temperature has been taken into account. It's no different than gravity. You can't change it. If you have a zircon crystal and you have helium inside of it, it is going to come out. Just like if you hold a ball up here and drop it, it's going to drop. And yet it's still there. That radioactive decay had to have happened within the last 6,000 years. Those rocks can't be millions of years old. And there's no answer to this that's ever been proposed. Now in math, you do multiplication and then you do division to kind of confirm it. So if we look in our atmosphere, we find out the total amount of helium. We know the size of our atmosphere. We know the concentration. The total amount of helium in the atmosphere is about three and a half trillion, 350 trillion kilograms. We know based on rock output and surveys and assays of various parts of our planet that helium's coming into the atmosphere at about 30 million kilograms per year. You divide the two, you come up with well, all that helium's gotten there in about 10,000 years. It agrees. It's amazing. It's a phenomenal evidence. There's something drastically wrong with the radiometric dating methods. There has been a rapid increase, probably at the time of creation, and maybe at the time of the flood, as God interacted with his creation to cause rapid radiometric decay. That's an exciting area for research because we don't have all the answers. Christianity doesn't have all the physical answers, but boy, we have the clues. Now, just a few other things that are really easy for people to understand. 
if human beings emerged about four million years ago, and that's what all the textbooks say, we became, our brains got bigger, we became the most intelligent creature on this planet and started using crude tools. And we assume that every time one of these ape-like creatures died, another one was born, and they only lived 25 years, you can divide the amount of time, well, let's make one more assumption, let's say there were never more than half a million ape-like creatures turning into people, okay, in Africa, in China, or wherever it's happening, um, there were never, every time one died, another one was born. That's, there's that many elephants in Africa, and they're on the extinct species list. I mean, they're endangered because there's that few. Got the whole globe, only half a million people, never more than that for a whole four million years. Turns out, in that amount of time, there should have been 80 trillion ape-like creatures that have lived and died. You could look at all the proposed ape-to-man links, and they're either clearly ape-like or clearly man-like, if you're really honest, and it wouldn't even cover this stage. You know, where are they all? The thing is, the time hasn't been there. Another question, where are all the graves? You know, all these ancient people, Neanderthal man, Cro-Magnon man, uh, they always buried their dead with valuable artifacts. Well, supposedly, they're smarter now, they must have learned to live longer. Let's say this, they, these 500,000 fully human, Human beings, Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal men are really considered to be human beings. They just lived, we're told, 50,000 years ago or so. Um, they were burying their dead. Every time they had a chance, they would bury the dead because they knew something came after this life. There would have been 50 million graves. Where are they all? We found a few hundred. You know, it's not the, the, it's the time that's missing, not the people in the graves that are missing. Um, how about the people? You see, historically, we've been doing censuses. The Chinese did census in the Bible. They were doing censuses. We can look archaeologically at the American Indians and the Aztecs and get an estimate of how many lived in certain places. And historically, for as far back as we can go, which is about 4,000 or so years, and then people just suddenly seem to appear in that range, if you don't make bad assumptions, the ancient Chinese, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Aztecs and Incas, they all just suddenly advanced cultures appeared kind of what we'd expect if smart people came off Noah's flood and started to repopulate the world in different cultures. The population's doubled about over 150 years, historically. And this has been independent of wars and the Black Death in Europe and diseases and people wiping out each other. Every 150 or so years, as far back as we can figure out, the population has doubled. Well, if you start with six people coming off the ark that would have continued to have families, Noah's three sons, and 150 years later, there were only 12 on the planet. That's pretty generous. And 300 years later, there's only 24 people on the planet. You know there would have been more. It turns out you have to double the population 30 times to get to the current world population. 30 doublings times 150 years, it only takes 4,500 years to reach the current world population. The question is, why aren't there a lot more people? It fits the biblical model. The magnetic field of the Earth is systematically decreasing. It's been shown to be decreasing by 15% in just the last 150 years. Now, there is no known mechanism that can show how the magnetic field of the Earth could be re-strengthened. We've been able to show how you could flip the magnetic field of the Earth, and it's actually a creation physicist, Russell Humphreys, that shows, has shown how that could happen rapidly in a matter of months. And he predicted you could go out and find iron-filled lava flows where they would be oriented in opposite directions between subsequent flows that happened in relatively short periods of time. And 10 years later, it's exactly what they found. You see, science needs to be predictable. But we've never shown how you could increase the total strength of the magnetic field. Well, if it was stronger in the past and it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and science cannot tell us how it could have gotten strong to begin with, that would indicate the Earth couldn't be infinitely old because in only six to 10,000 years, the field would be so strong, life wouldn't even be possible. 20,000 at an upper limit. Now, the bottom line issue for this whole age of the Earth is this whole idea of the global flood. You see, I'm going to talk about radiocarbon dating in a second. And it's the denial of the flood which gives the wrong answer for all these radiocarbon dates. You see, the flood would have wiped out this planet. It would have turned it into a mud flat. 
we, we think way too small in, in, as we think about the worldwide flood. And it would have caused a subsequent ice age as there was huge amounts of volcanism and the oceans warmed up and we had massive amounts of evaporation compared to today. Talk about a global ice age climate change today. That's a drop in a swimming pool compared to what was happening after the flood. And you would have built up those huge ice sheets and so on. Now, one other evidence that there really has been a flood, it would have buried animals, all sorts of animals, buried together around this world, but probably in ecological zones. Clams and coral might have been buried lowest and first because they were ocean bottom dwellers, more mobile fish later, mammals and other things later. You know, when we find dinosaur bones at the Dinosaur National Monument out in the west, out in, I believe it's in Utah, there are more clams buried in that deposit than dinosaur bones. They're just all jumbled up, torn apart, and mixed together. You see, it was a flood. In almost every dinosaur bone deposit, it's acknowledged that it's there because it was a flood deposit that flooded and buried it. Now, one of the things that happened just last year, earlier in the year, was that a PhD paleontologist, Mary Schweitzer, found a dinosaur that broke as they were pulling it up and putting it in the helicopter to lift it out. So they, she took the time for the first time ever, we've been finding dinosaur bones for 150 years, no one had ever bothered to do this because they're so blinded by their time frame. It's got to be millions of years. Dinosaurs went extinct 65 to 70 million years ago. Nobody bothered to look inside of the bones to see what they could find as they dissolved away the minerals, the mineral content. What she found was blood vessels that are so elastic you could stretch them and they would snap back. What she found were blood cells still inside the blood vessels. What she found were ligaments that were still stretchy and elastic. Now, the, the folks studying this, they have done everything they could possibly do to try to show these weren't dinosaur remains and they've totally failed. Every test has come back and said those are parts of a dinosaur. How could organic matter survive 65 million years without degrading? I'm going to show a video clip of an interview of a Dr. Schweitzer, and it just runs for a couple minutes, of talking about this find. Is that amazing to find this kind of soft tissue in a fossil this old? And what can the soft tissue really tell us? Um, well, it is, it is, it's very amazing. It's uh, utterly shocking, actually, because it flies in the face of everything that we understand about how tissues and cells degrade. Uh, it's not something that any one of us could ever predict or hope for. Um, and I, I think that it's important to remember that we, we don't know for sure what it still is. It looks like blood vessels, and it looks like um, bone matrix, and it certainly looks like cells, and it acts like cells. but. We haven't done the chemical analysis that let us say what it is for sure. Professor, I, a word uh, comes to us that uh, the capillary structure or something that you've observed is actually very similar to that of an ostrich. And I'm wondering, is this uh, add fuel to the, the idea that uh, the dinosaurs and birds were in fact related? Well, um, uh, potentially yes. Realize that the blood vessels in, in your bone look just exactly the same as well. Vessels um, at the level that we reported in the paper all kind of look the same. It's the molecular constituents that differ from one animal to another or from animals to humans. So the potential is there to, to really tell some differences, but for right now that's not something that we can address. How and one of the exciting things about this discovery, correct me if I'm wrong, is the fact that this stuff was fossilized as it was. At 70 million years old, you don't expect to find soft tissue, do you? Not at all. No. It's, it was utterly shocking. So you have to sort of rewrite the book as far as fossilization goes, I, I assume. Well, that's, that's the exciting part for me. I've always been very intrigued by how, uh, how things change in going from a living being to part of the rock record. And... Um, like I said, a lot of our science doesn't allow for this. All of the chemistry and all of the molecular breakdown experiments that we've done don't allow for this. So if this material turns out to be actual remnants of the dinosaur, then yes, I think we will have to do some, um, certainly rethinking of some of the basics of the model of fossilization. You know, well, Mary, Mary, when I was reading about this story, I was amazed that in some of the capillaries, when you went to, to pull them, they snapped right back. Are you amazed at the quality of these remains? Absolutely. 70 million I, years old, huh? It it's just doesn't seem possible. But yes, you can actually take the vessels and they, they do have, 
internal components and so you can take a probe and kind of squeeze those things out into solution and, and the, the vessels are fine. It's just, I, I can't explain it to be honest. I Very cool. Well, Professor Mary Schweitzer, congratulations and thank you very much for stopping by. Thank you so much. That's her response. See, not giving up on the time frame, but throwing out everything else she knows about science in order to hold on to the time frame. But it's not just God's word. You see, every culture in the world talks about the flood. It's the key event. If you get the flood wrong, you're going to get the time frame wrong because you've got to explain all these cliffs and rock layers and the cliffs of Dover and the coral reefs and the Grand Canyon and the fossil deposits. They're there. You've got to be able to explain them some way. And if you start by denying that there's been a worldwide flood, then you've got to have huge periods of time and you're going to come to the wrong conclusion about everything. But every culture, the Alaska Eskimos, they have a story of a worldwide flood. Why didn't they say God froze the world out? No, it's this flood story. The Armenians have a story of a worldwide flood. Why didn't they say they have earthquakes every 10 years or so? God just shook the world to bring judgment upon mankind. It's a story of a worldwide flood. It's because it's reality. And it was passed on and distorted, but it's still there in the remembrance of mankind. And the kind of things a flood like this will do, this is just one clip out of a whole hour talk. Uh, when Mount St. Helens erupted, the whole mountainside slid off. The whole top of the mountain mixed with steam and hot gas and ashes and it pulverized and it formed a big mud flow, fluid flow event and at 90 miles an hour slid down that mountain and filled in the valley. And then water built up behind it and a few months later broke through and in a matter of days, actually it's in a matter of hours, it formed an entire new river valley 600 foot deep. It's a 1 40th scale model of the Grand Canyon. And it allowed geologists to look at what does sediment look like as it has an enormous energetic flood flow event. And what they saw were fine horizontal layers sorted to different kinds of sediment at different levels that 10 years later you can take a ball bean hammer and pound on it and it's turned to solid rock. You see, there's no reason to believe huge periods of time have passed to lay down the sediment of this planet. Large geological formations can form very rapidly. Okay, now, the most popular, the dating technique you hear the most about is this radiocarbon dating. You find a mastodon and they'll go and they'll pull it up and they'll pull a piece of it out and they'll, they'll, they'll date it. Now this is how it works. You see, up in the atmosphere, there's lots of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen atoms, mostly nitrogen, and is an energetic particle comes from the sun, a gamma ray, and, and slams into a nitrogen molecule, it just blows it apart like a pool ball going into a set of racked um, uh, pool balls, a cue ball. And the neutrons of that blown apart nucleus are just floating around, they're not happy floating around, so they'll be grabbed by another nitrogen atom, and it turns that nitrogen-14 into carbon-14, which is radioactive. <laughs> The carbon grabs onto an oxygen and turns into CO2. Plants breathe in the CO2, make their cellular matter out of this radioactive carbon. Animals eat the plants, people eat the plants and animals. Everything alive gets a uniform distribution of this radioactive carbon that their very cells are built out of. And as long as we're alive and we're breathing and we're eating, we will have radioactive carbon our bodies built out of it in the same proportion that it is floating around up there in the atmosphere. It's about one part of radioactive carbon for one trillion parts of normal carbon, but it's measurable. Well, when something dies, it stops eating. And now, instead of replenishing the radioactive carbon, it starts to decay. And every 5,730 years, half of the radioactive carbon disappears, okay? We're gonna just, for simplicity, say every 5,000 years. So now I dig up a mastodon bone and I measure it and it has one-fourth the amount of radioactive carbon in it as things that are alive today, an elephant walking around out in Africa. Well, if, if half of it disappears every 5,000 years, in 5,000 years it would have one-half, in 10,000 years it would have one-fourth, in 15,000 years it would have one-eighth, in 20,000 years it would have one-sixteenth, if it had one-fourth, it would be 10,000 years old. If it had a sixteenth, it would be 20,000 years old. It, it makes sense. It's a logical dating method. It makes perfect sense. 
But it makes a very bad assumption. It assumes there has never been a worldwide flood. You see, what the earth would have been like before the flood was a paradise. There would have been lower rolling hills instead of the big mountains. India would have slammed into the European continent at the end of the flood, pushing up the Himalayas. The plates that formed the Rocky Mountains would have come together and pushed up as the flood was ending and water was rushing off the land. John Bob Gardner is the world's top expert in geophysical modeling of the movement of continental plates. He's shown that once you get these plates moving, you get what's called sheer plastic thinning, and you could move the American and the European continent into their present position in a matter of months. They're currently moving a centimeter a year, and it would take 20 million years to move them where they're at. But once you got them moving rapidly, they could move to where they're at in months. It would build up mountains rapidly. So the oceans were probably much shallower. Most of the life in the oceans is around the continental shelves. The entire ocean was probably a continental shelf. If you look at the amount of sea life buried as fossils, that's what the world would have been like before the flood. There was lush forests everywhere. If you go up into upper Canada, some of the islands off of Alaska, you find evidence of huge forests that have just been snapped off. The climate was totally different before the Ice Age. So you probably had conservatively 10, 20, 30 times as much living organisms on this planet before the flood. Now let's assume you get the same amount of radioactive carbon being generated. It's being spread through 20 times as much biomatter. The concentration in everything will be 1 20th of what it is today. So you take something that died shortly after the flood and measure the amount of carbon-14, it's going to have easily 1 16th the amount it has today. You're going to say it died 20,000 years ago. It may have died yesterday. You've just assumed there's never been a worldwide flood. And you get the totally wrong answer because you made the wrong assumptions. You assume the Bible's wrong, you get the wrong answers. But this is the bigger problem. There is radiocarbon left in everything. Remember I said half of it disappears every 5,000 years, ballpark. Well, in in within 250,000 years, there shouldn't be a single atom of radioactive carbon left, like in a dinosaur bone. You shouldn't be able to pick a dinosaur bone and find any radioactive carbon if it died 65 million years ago. You shouldn't. Coal was supposedly a couple hundred million years old. There should be no radiocarbon left, not a single atom. Yet everything still has radiocarbon in there. You see, modern equipment can measure 0.001% of current levels of radiocarbon. Yet every atom of carbon that we find, even diamonds, which are the hardest substance naturally known to man, nothing is going to permeate through, no modern carbon is going to permeate down into a diamond. It still has 100 to 500 times too much radiocarbon. It's this is, this is a chart of coal and wood and natural gas, which has probably come from decarbon, from decaying creatures for the most part, and shells and graphite and whale bones, and, and there's dinosaur bones that could be added to this. They all have a 100 to 500 times too much radiocarbon. The radiocarbon industry did a 10-year study from the mid-80s to the mid-90s where they went to extreme measures to try to keep any contamination out of samples that they pulled out of the ground, and they utterly failed because it's not contamination. The radiocarbon is there because things aren't as old as we're being told. It's, it's astounding evidence for a young Earth. Now, why does this all matter anyway? I pointed to the Scopes Monkey Trial, but I'm going to end here. You see, Charles Templeton, he was mentioned last night, but it, I think it bears a little harder look. Um, he was a young man who was absolutely convinced Christianity was true and Jesus Christ was who he said he was. He came as the solution to sin. Well, he was putting on big crusades in the early 30s. You know, fueled by the post-depression and, and the war and up into the 40s, you know, people just flocked in by the thousands to hear these crusades. He was a contemporary with Billy Graham, and some of the earlier he was one of the early leaders of these mass evangelism movements, born in 1915, acknowledged 
to be an even better preacher than Billy Graham. Um, as a matter of fact, um, he was a pastor, pastored a church, grew up here in Toronto. Um, he's, he started with only his family and friends. He became one of the vice presidents of Youth for Christ, an organization that still reaches out on college campuses today. Um, he spoke regularly, winning thousands to Christ in both America and Europe. Well, in a conversation to Billy Graham, and he recently wrote a book called Farewell to God, um, concerning his desire to attend Princeton University, he said, Billy, it's simply not possible to believe the biblical account of creation. The world wasn't created over a few days, a few thousand years ago. It's evolved over millions of years. This isn't a matter of speculation. It's a demonstrable fact. You see, that was the thing that totally convinced him you can't trust God's word. And he's being logical. If it's a fact that things are millions and billions of years old, every time on, on these 2,000 times that our kids and our neighbors and our friends hear this over and over and over again that things are millions and billions of years old, what it's really saying is you can't trust the Bible to mean what it says. That's what it's saying. That's the implication. It's saying death has always been around. And that's the theological implication. Because if all those rocks and all those fossils were laid down over huge periods of time, then death's always been around. And if God made man later, then death preceded man, and man's sin had nothing to do with death. So God is the author of death, the death in the animal world around us. And man's sin didn't cause death. And if God exists at all, he's the cause of death. And you certainly can't trust the Bible to mean what it says in a clear, straightforward way. And things will pretty much go on forever the way they are, because there's been all this time anyway. See, that's the mindset. It's the mindset of the youth. It's the mindset of the people around us, because they're not seeing the kind of evidences I've laid out here. And you certainly can't trust the Bible. And that's the critical issue. Now, you're going to get into prophecy tonight. Here's one. For about 1,800 years, there was pretty much a universal acceptance of the fact that we have a creator. It was often distorted. It wasn't always clear. It wasn't always a biblical creator. But all the cultures all over the world believed in a creator. There, as you saw from the stories, there was a universal acknowledgement that there has been a worldwide water catastrophe for probably 4,000 years. And definitely since Bible times up until the 1800s. But only in the last 150 years, there's been a denial of a creation. We can explain everything by natural forces. And there's been a denial of a flood. When do you ever hear about the flood as an explanation for dinosaurs or fossils or the rock layers or the dating methods, why they're wrong? You don't. You never hear it in our system. But this was predicted in the last days, scoffers will come denying that by the word of God the earth was made out of water, creation, and that the world that then existed perished being flooded by water. And this is where I want to end up. I don't know if you can see this very well, but I mentioned it last night because it comes up so frequently. People say, well, death's no big deal. It's just the natural order of things. And why are we revulsed by it? You know, this is a picture I found on the internet of a turtle that roadkill. I just typed in turtle roadkill and its guts are hanging out because I ran over one one day and I just felt terrible. You know, why do we feel bad when we kill another creature if it's the natural order of things? If we will go out for a picnic, we will sit on a log with our wife and have a meal. Who will go sit on the dead carcass of bleached out bones of, of a deer and have a meal? Because we're revulsed by death. It's not the natural order of things. And it's only Christ that brought an answer to that. What I've been doing for about 10 years is buy, I buy newspaper space and put articles in the book. Um, this book, Search for the Truth, is a bunch of those one-page articles that have been in now about a dozen different newspapers. And other folks have do it. And it changes people's lives and it changes their minds and helps them to learn to trust the Bible. And the CD in the back has all the text and illustrations and they're perforated to tear out the pages. I was stuck for an hour and a half in a traffic jam on the way here. I've produced 48 15-minute talks on these various subjects. So you can really understand to a greater degree how well science lines up with the Bible. And those are out there on the table. And then there's the daily devotional that, that just goes every day with a daily Bible verse and ties it into the physical world around us. 
So I would challenge you to dig deeper. All of these are referenced to more technical books, but share them with others because they're not going to hear the truth from the world. Okay, and we can open it up for questions at that point, unless we share it. Combine break time and question period here because okay. we're going to go straight into okay. more, more of a So who's got a question? I'll just go down and then just throw your hand up and if you want to take a break, just... What was I saying? What about this global warming? That was one of the questions. We just had Al Gore yep. with us yesterday. Yep, the inconvenient truth. Uh, that's his latest video. My um, my daughter came home from high school. Her class had watched the inconvenient truth. We're denying the catastrophe that's about to happen because mankind is ruining our planet with this activity, and we're bringing on another. Or we're we're causing global warming. Look at everything through biblical glasses, and I think it becomes so much more clear. This world underwent an enormous ice age only four to 5,000 years ago. It wasn't 20, 30,000 years ago. Those are all based on carbon dating, which are based on the denial of a flood. Only 5,000 years ago, we had ice all the way down into the Great Lake regions, um, and it took, according to Michael Ord, who's a meteorologist, somewhere in the four to eight hundred years for that ice to form and then re recede back close to present ages. Um, that's when mastodons were trapped as the Arctic Ocean froze over near the end of the Ice Age um, in huge numbers in Upper Canada and over into Siberia um, and, and they were basically trapped and died and were buried in, in the muck and ice which was then permanently frozen once the Arctic Ocean cooled down enough to freeze off. Um, all these things are explained by a biblical flood model. Now, we are still in the repercussions settling down phase after the global flood and the ice age. It's all happened in only the last five, six thousand year time period. So for me to get extremely excited about man's current 100 or 150 year activity causing a huge climate change when we can look at the enormous amount of climate change activity that's happened in the last even couple thousand years. Remember, the Bible describes Israel as a land flowing with milk and honey. Back at the time of Abraham and Moses, three to four thousand years ago, I think there was a huge, warm, moist climate in that region. And now it's a, it's a desert. And that hasn't been that long ago. So, yeah, global warming may be happening. A lot of the data supporting global warming has to do with ice cores, where they make certain assumptions of all these ice cores, and they look and they think they see multiple ice ages. But those are all based on assumptions and circular reasoning that assumes there's been millions of years for it to have formed. Um, I'm going to give an example that's in the book. In World War II in 1945, some uh, PT-45 bombers were forced to land in Greenland. They were forced down because of a snowstorm in Greenland. And they got out of there after a few days, but they had to leave their planes. Well, a couple of millionaires from Tennessee went up to Greenland to look for these planes. They thought, well, it's only, this is 1985, it's only been 40 years. We'll just dust the snow off the wings and we'll fly those planes out of there. We'll have ourselves some cool World War II planes. They found the planes under four, I believe, 400 foot of solid ice. 400 foot of ice had formed in 40 years. If you look at this depth of the ice sheets in the Arctic, they could have easily formed you know, a mile deep thick sheet of ice in a matter of thousands of years, not millions of years. The millions of years doesn't exist.